Chapter 10, Religion and Reform. The emergence of movements to reform the nation defines the next era of American history. An optimistic faith in human nature and the desire for order and control inspired efforts to create new institutions of reform and social control suited to the realities of a newly urbanizing age. American intellectuals were painfully aware of the low regard in which Europeans held their culture in the 1830s and 40s. They responded in part by embracing a movement known as Romanticism and committed themselves to the liberation of the American spirit. Romanticism might as well be uh, an event as well as an idea here. The Hudson River School of Painters, inspired by individuals like Ralph Waldo Emerson, considered nature far more than civilization the best source of wisdom. Emerson rejected the staid cultural traditions of Europe and embraced new visions of existence and truth for a new group of people, these Americans. Ralph Waldo Emerson. American painters of the Romantic era, like those of the Hudson River School, seemed to announce that in America, unlike in Europe, wild nature still existed and that America held greater promise than the overdeveloped lands of the old world. In American literature, James Fenimore Cooper distinguished his work with the evocation of the American West. His most important novels, The Last of the Mohicans and The Deerslayer, examine the experience of the rugged white frontiersmen with Indians, pioneers, violence, and the law. James Fenimore Cooper. Cooper evoked the ideals of the independent American with a natural inner goodness. Walt Whitman, America's urban poet and uh, author of the expression, the American Yawp, he celebrated democracy, the liberation of the individual and the pleasures of the human experience. Less exuberant than Whitman was uh, Herman Melville, uh, author of famously Moby Dick, who used his work to criticize the harsh individualistic and achievement driven culture uh, that, uh, of 19th century America. Edgar Allan Poe, Poe, a Southern writer, evoked images of individuals rising above the narrow confines of intellect and exploring deeper and often terrifying worlds of spirits and emotions. Other Southern writers focused on ordinary people and poor people, white and black alike, and treated them deliberately and sometimes pain, uh, with painfully vulgar and realistic depictions. That movement found its strongest voice in the words of Mark Twain, or Samuel Clemens. Christian Unitarians, in the era came to reject key aspects of Orthodox Protestant belief, laying the groundwork for the transcendentalist movements. The transcendentalists will come out of the Unitarian church, Christian church, Unitarians. The transcendentalists led by Ralph Waldo Emerson explored paths to beauty and truth by rejecting the concept of understanding and instead pursuing transcendent states of consciousness. Transcendentalists worked for communion with the natural world through individuality and a rejection of society itself. Henry David Thoreau's own effort to free himself, uh, immortalized in his book, Walden, uh, written when his, during his time, his two years at Walden Pond, uh, led him to build a small cabin in the Concord Woods where he lived simply and wrote, wrote for that period of two years. His 1849 essay, Resistance to Civil Government, extended his critique of the artificial constraints in society and government and argued for a total rejection of unjust laws like slavery. The transcendentalists were among the first Americans to anticipate the environmental movement that would come over a century later, despite having no scientific basis uh, for their defense of wildness and wilderness. Transcendentalism also spawned visions of American utopia. At Brook Farm near Boston, that belongs up here, Brook Farm, I should mention that Thoreau is a student of um, Emerson. So we have Thoreau who inspires Emerson. So at Brook Farm uh, near Boston, transcendentalists like Nathaniel Hawthorne, the writer, saw their experiments at cooperative societies in an attempt to create utopia fail. It was later writings like The Scarlet Letter and The House of Seven Gables, or through those writings, he argued that the price individuals pay for cutting themselves off from society, uh, egotism was the concept he claimed that the transcendentals were embracing, was the serpent that lay at the heart of human misery. He said people should not cut it, himself off. He rejected the transcendentalists later in life. Attempts to organize cooperative egalitarian societies continued throughout the second half of the 19th century. At the Oneida community in upstate New York, the Oneidans, Oneida silverware, Google that and you'll, you'll learn a little bit more about the Oneidans. Uh, all residents of the original Oneida community were married to all other residents. There would be no permanent conjugal ties in this commune. 
It was not an experiment in free love, though. It was not an experiment in free love. It was a place where the community monitored sexual behavior, where women were protected from unwanted childbearing from husbands, and where children were raised communally, often seeing little of their birth parents in comparison to other people. Oneidans took pride in what they considered women's liberation for the, from the demands of male lust with this arrangement and from the bonds of traditional family roles. The Shakers, too, uh, redefined traditional gender roles with their attempt at utopia, the Shakers. Small segments of the Shakers still around. Shakers were defined by the practice of shaking themselves free of sin. And they were committed to the simple Christian lives of complete celibacy, meaning, of course, that no one could be born into the faith because there were no children. Everyone had to choose to commit to the faith. All Shakers had to choose voluntarily. This practice obviously limited their numbers, but a small pocket of Shakerism survives today. These new modes of living were not only motivated to equalize gender roles, these romantics were trying to create a society set apart from the chaos and the disorder that they believed had come to define urban American life. Mormonism, perhaps the most American of religions, the Mormons, uh, was created in this era. Joseph Smith, at the age of 24, published his Book of Mormon, which he had translated from a set of golden tablets he said he found the, in, in the hills of New York, as revealed to him by an angel of God. The Book of Mormon tells the story of two ancient Native American civilizations whose people had anticipated the coming of Jesus Christ. Smith believed Jesus came to America after his resurrection, an event that is not mentioned in traditional in the King James Bible. Though both Native societies collapsed because of their eventual rejection of Christ's principles, uh, Joseph Smith believed his story of these righteous societies could serve as a model for a new holy community within the United States. His group of followers, the Latter-day Saints, as they're sometimes called, spent 15 years searching for a hospitable place to practice their faith. The radical religious doctrines, claims that new prophets, new scripture, divine authority, and later polygamy within the faith, was always met with persecution from their neighbors. Driven from community to community, Brigham Young, who had assumed leadership of the Latter-day Saints after Smith was murdered, took his 12,000 followers across the Great Plains and over the Rocky Mountains to present-day Salt Lake City, where, more, where the Mormons created a lasting settlement that obviously exist through to this day. Like other experiments in social organization of the era, Mormonism reflected a belief in human perfectibility. God had once been a man, the church taught, and thus every man or woman could aspire to move continuously closer to God. Mormonism created a haven for white people demoralized by the disorder and the uncertainty of the secular world, and in their society they found security and order. The reform impulse in America, uh, in America helped create new movements intent on remaking American society movements which incorporated women into the rank and file of the leadership. By the 1830s, such movements had become fully organized reform societies. Protestant revivalism rooted in the Second Great Awakening had evolved into a powerful force for social reform by the 1820s. So-called new light evangelicals embraced the optimistic belief that every individual was capable of individual salvation, and they focused their uh, early efforts against drunkenness. No social vice, temperance advocates argued, was more responsible for crime, disorder, and poverty in America than the excessive use of alcohol. Temperance. Women were attracted to the cause of temperance because they knew that men abused their wives and neglected their families under the influence of alcohol. Nativists, on the other hand, joined the temperance movement, which will become the prohibition movement against alcohol. They did this as a way to bring order to the unruly immigrant populations of America's cities who very much consumed alcohol. By 1840, temperance had become a major national political movement, boasting more than a million followers who had taken a formal pledge to abstain from hard liquor. For some Americans, the search for individual and social perfection promoted uh, new theories in human health and science. Threats to public health were sources of insecurity that spawned many reform movements, especially after the terrible cholera epidemics of the 19th century. Mid-century Americans were eager for scientific progress that would improve their lives. They spent their free time in spas and varied their diets according to the newest ideas of health and wellness. They also embraced the science of, science of phrenology, which used skull measurements to supposedly ascertain individual fitness for individual pursuits and professions. Medicine lagged in this era of rapid technological and scientific advancement. The smallpox uh, vaccine had been a brilliant adaptation of an old folk remedy, and physicians tended to mistrust innovation and experimentation during this era. However, in 1843, Boston essayist uh, Oliver Wendell Holmes published a study that supported the idea of contagion theory, the idea that diseases might be transmitted from person to person. 
education reform arrived beginning in 1837 when Horace Mann, Horace Mann and his followers reorganized the Massachusetts state school system, lengthened the academic year, and introduced new methods of professional training for teachers. To man, education was the only way to preserve America's democracy. For an educated elector, it was essential to a free political system. By the 1850s, the principle of tax-supported elementary schools was established in all of the, in every single American state. And by the Civil War, the United States had one of the highest literacy rates in the world, reaching 94% in the North and 83% of the white population in the South. New institutions of the era uh, were, were developed to help the disabled, the orphaned, We'll have orphanages in this era, and the unstable, the mentally ill, were spawned out of this reform movement. Uh, schools for the blind, orphanages, and asylums for criminals and the mentally ill were established to give America's most marginalized populations dignified places for education and self-improvement. New forms of prison discipline, including solitary confinement, were created with the explicit goal of uplift and rehabilitation. The same impulse moved American politicians away from relocation policies and toward the establishment of reservations for Native Americans. Just as prisons, asylums, and orphanages would provide society with an opportunity to train and uplift the misfits and the unfortunate within white society, so too the reservations, it was believed, might provide a way to undertake what one official called the great work of regenerating the Indian race. So funny, by today's standards, we look at these as, as colossal failures, but we, we have to put ourselves in the mindset of those in the middle of the 19th century. These were their best ideas for trying to create progress within these marginalized groups. Many of the women involved in the reform efforts in the 1820s and 30s came to resent the social and legal restrictions that limited their ability to affect change. As some men protested efforts by their wives, mothers, and sisters to participate in the temperance and abolition movements, leaders like Harriet Beecher Stowe Elizabeth Cady Stanton and Susan B. Anthony. Right there. They all countered those criticisms, criticisms with moral arguments for an equal obligation between the sexes to work for a just and fair society. These women became perhaps inadvertently the first American feminists. Feminism. They weren't calling themselves that at the time. At the 1840 World uh, Anti-Slavery Convention in London, Female delegates were turned away by the men who controlled the proceedings. Over the next several years, American women worked to highlight the parallels between the plight of women and the plight of African slaves in the South. And in 1848, eight years after they were turned away from that convention, they met in Seneca Falls, New York, Seneca Falls, New York, to discuss the question of women's rights. Out of that event came a document, the Declaration of Sediments and Resolutions, I put it here as an idea, but it's also an, an event, and so is the rejection of them at that 1840 conference. 1840 anti-slavery convention. This will inspire women to think of themselves as a di distinct group in need of um, additional rights. Uh, that Declaration of Sentiments and Resolutions, written almost entirely by Quaker women, argued that all men and women are created equal think back to the Declaration of Independence, and that the right to vote belonged to both sexes. In demanding that right, these American feminists launched a movement for women's suffrage that would last until the Constitution was amended in 1920. Though the anti-slavery movement had existed in America for some time, to learn more about that, see the creation of the nation of Liberia, an attempt to get uh, blacks, return blacks back to the African continent and give them self-determination. Only by 1830 did this movement begin to gather force that would make it the most urgent reform that Americans had ever seen. With slavery spreading rapidly, with the explosion of cotton across the South and on the back of the cotton gin, William Lloyd Garrison emerged as an articulate leader of what would become called, become known as the abolitionist movement. William Lloyd Garrison. William Lloyd Garrison. Garrison's philosophy was so simple that it was genuinely revolutionary. Opponents of slavery, he said, should not talk about the evil influence of slavery uh, upon white society, but rather the damage it did to blacks directly. And that's counterintuitive because when we think of slavery, we think of it in, in, uh, in Garrison's mindset and we think of the negative impacts. Uh, reformers before then talked about the impact upon voters and why they should try to reform slavery and gradually get rid of it because of its negative impact on white society. Garrison flipped the script. Uh, they should, therefore, abolitionists should reject that gradualism and demand immediatism, the abolition of slavery today, uh, and the extension to all blacks, all rights of American citizenship, immediatism. 
His newspaper, The Liberator, was an unapologetic, was as unapologetic as it was fervent on this issue, and it attracted a rapt audience among the free black population of the North. Black lead, uh, leaders, including David Walker, Sojourner Truth, and Frederick Douglass, Frederick Douglass, also emerged as powerful and eloquent spokespeople for the cause of abolition. Douglas, a former slave, had escaped to Massachusetts in 1838 and emerged as an electrifying orator when he lectured on the subject in England. Upon his return to America, he purchased his freedom from his Maryland owner and started his own abolitionist newspaper. And he wrote an autobiography that painted a damning portrait of the effects of slavery. In response to this growing abolitionist movement, anti-abolitionists rose up across the South and in small pockets of the North. Southerners understood the implications that abolition would have on their way of life. Anti-abolitionists, there, there will be a response to this. While Northerners feared an influx of Southern blacks and worried a civil war, a civil war could erupt over the issue of this immediatism. Philadelphia in 1834, anti-abolitionists burned an abolitionist headquarters to the ground and started a race riot. Another mob seized William Lloyd Garrison on the streets of Boston a year later and threatened to hang him. In Illinois, uh, Elijah Lovejoy, the editor of another abolitionist newspaper, was killed when he tried to defend his printing press from attack. That so many men and women continue to embrace uh, absolutism or immediatism in the face of such vicious opposition by anti-abolitionists suggests that abolitionists were not people who made their political commitments lightly. They were a minority of moral crusaders whose fervency, not unlike as America's early, earlier revolutionaries, threatened to upset the social and political order of the entire nation for its own good. The abolitionist movement splintered in 1840 as an increasingly radical element led by Garrison embraced a host of related issues, the full incorporation of women into the cause, extreme pacifism that rejected even defensive wars, opposition to all forms of coercion, including prisons and asylums, the outright condemnation of the United States Constitution, and finally, the call for Northern disunion from the American South. After 1840, the cause of abolition moved in many channels and spoke in many different voices. Mo more moderate voices than Garrison's uh, called for the uh, appeal to the conscience of slaveholders directly. When that produced no results, and that was the gradualism that uh, Garrison had, had rejected, they turned to political action seeking to induce Northern states and the federal government to aid their cause. The Amistad case in particular signifies the slow but steady progress of that cause. Another voice, the Liberty Party in American politics, never campaigned for outright abolition. They stood instead for free soil. This is what Lincoln will embrace. Or for keeping slavery and, in essence, blacks out of new American territories. This ideology did what abolition and, and the radical abolition of Garrison never could do. It attracted the support of large numbers of the white population of the North. Those frustrated with the slow pace of political progress sometimes resorted to dramatic action including violence to emancipate slaves. It was a group of prominent abolitionists in New England who funneled money and weapons to John Brown for his bloody uprisings in Kansas and Virginia. Others attempted to arouse public anger through propaganda. The most powerful of all abolition propaganda was Harriet Beecher Stowe's novel, Uncle Tom's Cabin. Obviously it contains ideas, but I think it's a piece of technology for our purposes. It flew off store shelves and had to be reprinted previously. People could not stop buying this book. It succeeded in bringing the message of abolition to an enormous new audience, both in book form and on stage across the country. It was made into a play. Reviled throughout the South, Harriet Beecher Stowe became a hero in the movement, and her novel ignited sectional tensions in both the North and the South. Though the abolition movement failed to achieve significant progress before the Civil War, the men and women of the cause kept the flame lit for nearly three decades, gradually revealing to American people the hypocrisy of slavery existing in a nation dedicated to the proposition that all men are created equal. By the time the United States Civil War erupted in 1861, the religious and reform movements of the antebellum period had made and left an indelible mark in the American landscape. Narratives of moral and social decline, known as Jeremy ads, had added urgency to reform movements in this period. The Second Great Awakening had ignited Protestant spirits by connecting evangelical Christians and national networks of faith and it reinvigorated in the camp meeting movement that I've mentioned in previous chapters. Social reform spurred members of the middle class to promote national morality and the public good for the first time. Not all reform movements were equally successful. With the temperance movement uh, making substantial inroads against the excesses of alcohol consumption, the abolitionist movement had proved so divisive that it had paved the way for the sectional crisis. Yet participation in reform movements, regardless of their success, encouraged many Americans to see themselves in new ways. 
Black activists became a powerful voice in anti-slavery societies, for example, developing domestic and transnational connections to pursue the cause of liberty. Middle-class women's dominant presence in the benevolent empire encouraged them to pursue a full-fledged women's rights movement that lasted in various forms up through the present day. In their efforts to make the United States a more virtuous and moral nation, 19th century reform activists developed cultural and institutional foundations for social change that have continued to reverberate throughout the 20th and the 21st centuries.